Hello everyone, this week we are going to talk about GDP, which measures the nation's income. So the nation's income is measured by gross domestic product or GDP. Let's first define this term. It's the market value of final goods and services produced within a country during a specific time period, usually a year. GDP is the most widely used indicator of economic performance. In GDP, when you look at the definition, only final goods and services count. So sales at intermediate stages of production are not counted as their value is embodied within the final user good. Let's do one example. Let's say you buy latte from Starbucks. Latte. And you know that latte has milk in it. And now Starbucks purchases milk from the store. So milk has a purchase price, so it has a value. It's supposed to be in the GDP. But it's not correct. Why? Because the purchase price of the milk is already included in the latte. When you pay for latte, let's say $5, you are actually paying for the milk included in the latte as well. Therefore, in order to not to double count the value of the production in the country, only final goods are included in the calculation of GDP. So let's see one example on the slide. We see the stages of production. Stage one, first farmer harvests the wheat, and then second stage two, millers turn wheat into flour, and stage three, bakers turn flour into bread, and stage four, grocery store sells the bread. So at the end, total consumer expenditure is $1 because the consumer is paying $1 to buy the bread. Let's see in terms of value added, how much each stage contributes to the GDP. In stage one, farmers value added is 30 cents by harvesting the wheat and selling to the miller. In stage two, we are not going to again count this 30 cents, right? We need to count the value added by the miller and therefore we add 35 cents. From the baker's point of view, we are not going to add value added by farmer because it's double counting or the miller's flour. We will only add baker's value added, which is 25 cents. And finally, the grocer's bread is going to add only 10 cents and you are going to ignore the value added by farmer, miller, and then finally by the baker. Therefore, if you sum 30 cents plus 35 cents plus 25 cents plus 0.1, it's $1. Total expenditure is $1 on the bread, therefore $1 should be included in the GDP. Let's continue on what counts toward GDP or not. First of all, only transactions involving production count. So financial transactions like buying bonds or stocks, this is important, buying bonds or stocks are not included in GDP. Okay, this is not in the GDP or income transfers are excluded because they do not reflect actual production. What do we mean by income transfers? For instance, social security payments, unemployment insurance, veteran payments are not included in the GDP. Why? Because it's a transfer of money from one pocket to another. So the government collects taxes and then redistribute this income to the people who need it. There is no production in return for this change of income. For that reason, income transfers are not included in the GDP. Next, only production within the geographic borders of the country is counted. For instance, if Mazda, Mazda is not a US company, produces in Texas, then it's included in the GDP. But Ford producing in Mexico, although Ford is an American company, it's not included in the GDP. So everything that are produced inside the country are included in the GDP, regardless of the nationality of the company. Next, only those goods produced during the current period are counted. So therefore, the purchase and sale of goods produced during early years are not counted in this year's GDP. For instance, you sell your iPhone 13 in the market, and let's say for an $800, this is not included in GDP. Why? Because iPhone 13 purchase price has already been included in the GDP where it's first produced. Therefore, used products, resale prices are not included. You have to focus on the current production. Dollars are the common denominator for GDP. GDP is measured in dollars. Let's understand this with an example. Let's say we have a small economy, island, a and it produces 1 million oranges and island B produces 1 million cars. 
So which island has higher GDP? Island B. Why? Because cars has more value than oranges. Although they produce the same number of goods, island B has more income. The reason is GDP is measured in dollars. It's the total spending on all final user goods and services produced during the year and they are all summed them up in dollar terms to obtain annual GDP. GDP as a measure of both output and income. So GDP can be measured in two ways. You can either look at total expenditures on final goods or you can look at the total dollar flow of income of final goods. So in order to understand why these two approaches brings us the same GDP number, let's think about you spend $10 in Starbucks. So this is your total expenditure, right? You spend $10 in a Starbucks coffee store. And then it turns out to be an income for Starbucks, right? Starbucks pays rents. Rent is an income for landlord. Starbucks pays wage. Wage is an income for labor. Starbucks buy ingredients. Become, this becomes an income for other firms. Starbucks pays for utility, which is an income for other firms. Starbucks pays tax, which is an income for government. As you see, every, every dollar you spend in the economy becomes an income for somebody else. Therefore, you can either look at total expenditures or you can look at the total dollar flow of income to calculate GDP. So GDP is a measure of both output and income. And GDP can be derived by totaling the expenditures on final user goods and services produced during the year. This is called the expenditure approach. Alternatively, GDP can be calculated by summing the income payments to the resources suppliers and the indirect cost of producing the goods and services, and this is called resource cost income approach. Let's look at first expenditure approach. GDP is the sum of expenditures on final user goods and services purchased by households, investors, governments and foreigners. So therefore, when you calculate GDP by this method, you have four components. Household spending is called consumption. Firm spending is called investment, but this investment also includes the inventories. Government spending on goods and services is called government expenditure. And net exports represents exports, which are the goods sold to foreign customers, minus imports, which are the goods are bought from foreign people. So that's why it's called net exports, net exports, NX. The second way of calculating GDP is resource cost income approach. GDP is the sum of costs incurred and income generated by the production of goods and services in the period. So the direct cost income components of GDP, the first one is employee compensation, which represents wage, right? Wage is the income for labor. Self-employment income. So there are small businesses that have only one employee, which is the owner, and this income also included. Rents is an income for landlords and interest is an income for capital and we have the corporate profits. All of these represents the national income. Not all cost components of GDP result in an income payment to a resource supplier. To get GDP using this method, we need to account for three other factors. Indirect business taxes, like sales tax, right? Taxes that increase firms' production costs. The next one is depreciation. What is depreciation? The cost of wear and tear on the machines and other capital assets used to produce goods and services. And finally, we have net income of foreigners. The income that foreigners earn producing goods within the borders of US minus the income Americans earn abroad. When GDP is derived using the resource cost income approach, it's calculated first starting with national income, which includes wages, self-employment income, rents, interests, and corporate profits, plus indirect business tax, which is sales tax, which is an income for the government, and then plus depreciation, which you need to spend for wearing and tearing for the machines, and finally you need to add net income of foreigners. So let's compare these two approaches. It seems like expenditure approach is much easier. Why? Because you have consumption, investment, and then government expenditures and net exports. You sum all these things to get the GDP.
For resource cost income approach, first calculate the national income. National income wages, income to small businesses, rents, profits, and interest, plus non-income cost items, sales tax, indirect business tax, depreciation, plus net income of foreigners. And you'll have the same GDP number. Either you use expenditure approach or income approach. Let's look at the GDP components using two different approaches. When you look at the expenditure approach, the biggest component of GDP is actually spending on consumer goods, 68%. And the next one is government spending, and the third one is investment. When you look at the income approach, the biggest component comes from wages, right? Employee compensation. And the next one is depreciation, and the next one is corporate profits. Now we are going to talk about adjusting for price changes and driving real GDP. First, let's understand why real GDP is important. The one that we learn up until now is the nominal GDP. Nominal GDP means that you are going to calculate GDP by using current prices of the goods. So if let's say apple is $2 and this small country produces 10 apples, then the nominal GDP from 10 apples is $20. And let's say this country also produces 20 oranges, each is $3, and that is going to bring us $60 income or expenditure. So the total value of goods produced in this island is $80. Okay. But let's assume that this is the number for 2021, and in 2022, this island is producing the same number of apples and same number of oranges, but the prices are different. Now the apples are $3 and oranges are $4. Now let's calculate the nominal GDP for 2022. 3 times 10, $30, and then 4 times 20, $80, and the total income rises to 110. So we see that the country's income this island country is a small country, increases from 80 to 110 from 2021 to 2022. But does this mean that this country produces more goods and enjoy a better life? Are they eating more apples and oranges? No. The increase in income is because increase in prices, but this island is still produces the same number of goods and services. Therefore, in order to make the correct comparison between the years, we have to actually keep the prices constant to see a growth in production. So living standard is determined by increase in production, not increase in prices. Therefore, real GDP, real means here adjusted for inflation. And in order to calculate the real GDP, we need price indices. What is a price indices? Price indices are used to adjust income and output data for the effects of inflation. So a price index measures the cost of purchasing basket, let's say it's a basket here in 2021, at a point in time relative to the cost of purchasing the same basket, let's say 2010, during an earlier reference or base year. So let's say in this basket 10 apples and 20 oranges. In this basket you have 10 apples and 20 oranges too. So you want to compare the cost here to the same basket if you wanted to purchase it in 2010. That's called price index. So we have three types of price indices. The first one is consumer price index, CPI. In this consumer price index, the basket is composed of consumer goods that a typical consumer purchases in a month. In chain consumer price index, it's actually a correction of CPI. Why? Because CPI is a fixed basket. It doesn't change from 2021 to 2022. If you have one car, two apples in this basket, you have still one car and two apples in this basket. Or if you have 10 pounds of beef, 20 tons of chicken, the same 10 pounds of beef and 20 pounds of chicken in the consumer basket. So why this is a problem? This is a problem because usually people are going to substitute expensive goods, the, the goods that have higher prices with the cheaper alternatives. So let's say if the beef price is $5 here, but increased to $10 in 2022, people are going to buy less beef, let's say five pounds, but they buy more chicken and assume that chicken prices doesn't increase that much. 
So as you see, because of that substitution effect, CPI doesn't reflect the real cost of living. But chain CPI corrects for that. Why? Because it's a version of CPI that adjusts the quantities of the typical market basket each month to reflect the impact of shifts away from goods that have become relatively more expensive. And the last one is GDP deflator. GDP deflator is a basket too, but this time in GDP deflator, you have all goods produced in the country during that year. So what are the key differences between price indices? GDP deflator is a broader price index than the CPI. It reflects the bundle included in GDP, while the CPI reflects only the bundle purchased by households. Because of their more frequent updating of the typical market bundle and adjustment for substitution away from goods with higher relative prices, the chain CPI and GDP deflator generally provide a slightly lower estimate for the annual rate of inflation than traditional CPI. Why? Because both GDP deflator basket and chain CPI basket is updated, but CPI basket uses fixed amount and the same number of goods in the basket. For that reason, GDP deflator and chain CPI produces a slightly lower estimate for the annual rate of inflation. So what is inflation? Inflation is an increase in the general level of prices. It's typically calculated annually. Inflation can be calculated using any of the price indices. The rate of inflation is calculated here. This year's CPI minus last year's CPI divided by last year's CPI. If you don't use CPI, you can replace this with GDP deflator. You are going to use one of the price indices to calculate inflation rate. So you see one example here, CPI, chain CPI and GDP deflator in 2000 and 2015. Let's look at first the inflation rate in 2001. It increases by 2.8%, right? Why? Because CPI increases from 100 to 102.8. How do we calculate inflation rate here? 102.8 minus 100 divided by 100 times 100 will give you 2.8%. And when you use chain CPI, you end up having a lower inflation rate. That is common, right? Because these baskets, both of them, chain CPI and GDP deflator is updated. And how we calculate the same idea, we this time use chain CPI minus 100 divided by 100 times 100, which is 2.3%. And GDP deflator will give you, again, very similar picture, 2.3% inflation rate in 2001. We can use GDP deflator, which is the price index, to drive real GDP. Remember, real GDP is adjusted for the prices. Nominal GDP uses current prices, but real GDP uses constant prices. So how we can adjust real GDP using GDP deflator? Therefore, real GDP in year two is equal to nominal GDP in year two times GDP deflator in the base year divided by GDP deflator in year two. So here, this represents the base. This represents the current, current year. This is current and this is current. Data on both money, which is nominal GDP, and price changes are essential for meaningful comparisons of output between two time periods. Here you can see one example. Between 2000 and 2012, nominal GDP increased by 24.4%, which is here 14.4 trillion, and it increased to 17.9 trillion in the United States. And the price index rises by 9.8% because in 2009 it's a base year, GDP deflator is 100. And in 2012 it's 109.8, that means prices increase over the three years 9.8%. So real GDP increases from 14.4 trillion to 16.3 trillion, which is an increase of 13.3%. So as you see, the increase in real GDP doesn't reflect the increase in prices. Therefore, it's lower than nominal GDP. And nominal GDP increases more than real GDP because it shows the increase in prices plus the increase in quantity. This shows only increase in prices. This shows only increase in quantity. Therefore, real GDP is a better comparison of living standards over time. We also need to convert earlier figures into current dollars to make a correct comparison 
between the numbers throughout the periods. Sometimes we will want to make real data comparisons in terms of the purchasing power of the dollar during the current year. This can be done by inflating the data for early years for increases in the price level. The formula for converting the figures for an earlier year into current dollar is figure current dollar is equal to figure earlier dollar times price index current year divided by price index earlier year. If prices have risen, this will inflate the data for earlier years and bring them into line with the current purchasing power of the data. So the basic idea of this information on the slide is about comparing, for instance, you work for a company, sales from 1970s and you have sales from 2020. You can compare the dollar figures of sales 1970 and sales 2020. You need to convert these numbers first. I mean, you need to bring these dollars because you know that when these sales were earned, the cost of living was much cheaper. So we need to know the sales earned at that period, how much it has purchasing power with today's dollars. Therefore, we need to convert this number to 2020 and then we can compare sales after converting. Next, we talk about problems with GDP as a measuring road. Here you can see the shortcomings of GDP on the slide. First of all, it doesn't count non-market production. Let's say you take care of child at home. This service doesn't have a market value, doesn't count in GDP. But if you send your kid to a daycare, then it's in the GDP. Second, it doesn't count the underground economy. Some people, to get income transfers from the government, they misreport their status to IRS. They work under the table, they earn income, but they also get benefit from the government. Therefore, this is not included in the GDP. And GDP doesn't make adjustments for leisure. So if you work 20 hours a day, GDP increases. But does this mean that you have a better life? No, because you don't have time for leisure. Therefore, the value of the leisure is not counted in GDP. GDP probably understates output increases because of the problem of estimating improvements in the quality of products. And finally, GDP doesn't adjust for harmful side effects. Let's say there's a production, so more production means higher GDP, but that production maybe harms the environment. And that cost is not subtracted from that production. For that reason, the GDP doesn't differentiate between a good production and a bad production. Next, we talk about GDP per capita. So what is GDP per capita? GDP per capita is equal to GDP divided by population. So it says that if I divide the GDP, the total income, equally among the people living in that country, how much each of them will get? That is GDP per capita. That doesn't mean that everybody will earn that money. It means that if we equally distribute the income, how much each person gets. For instance, in 2015, GDP per capita for US is 50.8K. So that doesn't mean that everybody earns 50.8K. Some people earn $1 million a year, some people only 20K. But if I divide the total pie equally among the population, then each person will get that much. So why GDP per capita is important? GDP per capita is important to make international comparisons. Let's look at this example. US GDP in 2022 is $19.1 trillion. China's GDP in 2022 is $14.5 trillion. So it seems like China is the second highest income country in the world. But, but do they have very similar living standards when you compare US and China? The answer is no. Why? Because China is producing this much income by 1.6 billion people. US is producing this much income by 310 million people. If you adjust for this population differences, then GDP per capita for US in 2022 is 63K. For China, it's 12.5K. As you see, the living standards in US is much better compared to China when you take into account the population. As was shown in the previous exhibit, real US per capita GDP has increased substantially over the past 82 years. Compared to earlier periods, current GDP is probably biased upward because more output now takes place in the market sector and less in the household sector.
However, it is also probably biased downward because of failure to adjust for increased leisure, improvements in the work environment and the introduction of improved products and new technologies. The direction of the overall bias is uncertain. In spite of all these shortcomings, the evidence indicates that real GDP per person is a broad indicator of living standards. As real per capita GDP in the United States has increased through time, the quality of most goods has increased while the amount of work time required for their purchase has declined. Similarly, as real per capita GDP has risen in the United States and other countries, life expectancy and leisure time have gone up, while illiteracy and infant mortality rates have gone down. However, the great contribution of GDP is its ability to measure short-term fluctuations in output. Year to year, and quarter-to-quarter quarter changes in real GDP provide a reasonable, precise measure of what is happening to the rate of output. And this is the end of chapter 7.